and all poor, all peaceful and all hard, all fearless, all afraid, all angry, all rejoice, all doubt.
All right, good morning, everybody. Hey, a couple quick announcements as we get started here. Um, so first announcement, uh, April 7th, which is today, we're going to be having our VBS uh, potluck. And uh, this is like an informational meeting potluck, so this is just an opportunity for us to get together. If you are interested in helping out with VBS this year, which will be in June, uh, near the end of June, this is a good opportunity for you to come and find out more information about the theme and ways that you can help out. So if you are free, um, the volunteer meeting is at 4.30 tonight, so please come to that. Uh, our second announcement, April 11th, which is this coming Thursday, is Folks Like Us. Um, and so uh, Folks Like Us is just a, it's a fun time of uh, just singing hymns together, eating some food together. I know it says seniors and retirees, but like, they, they don't mind if you're a little bit younger. So uh, I, I go. It's a lot of fun. So if you are available, it's uh, Thursday at 1130 a.m. And it's just a good time to, to pick out some hymns and sing together. Larry breaks out his guitar, and uh, it's a blast. So I would encourage you to come to that if you're able. Um, and then just a couple days after that, on April 13th, on Saturday, this upcoming Saturday, is Bloom, which is one of our women's ministries here at the church. Uh, Bloom is a great opportunity to just get together as women uh, in the church to um, spend some time in worship and to listen to an engaging speaker and uh, to just have a, a good time together, and it's a brunch. So um, if you are able to come to this, child care is provided, so if, like, if that is uh, a hurdle for you, don't worry about that. Child care will be provided. And this is for any ladies that are in ninth grade or older. So if you're interested in this, uh, you should definitely come. It's a really cool opportunity. And then a uh, final actual announcement I have is April 14th, which is next Sunday, is uh, Sunday night. We are going to be doing our partners meeting. So that's going to be at 6 p.m. So if you are a partner here at Meadowbrook, you're going to want to be at this meeting for sure. If you're not a partner, you are still more than welcome to come uh, to hear kind of just what's going on at the church, updates, those kinds of things. Um, but um, yeah, you're still more than welcome to come. This is a good opportunity just to kind of get um, an idea of what's going on here at the church. So with that, we're going to watch a short video. So that is just a little video. Uh, a 13-year-old actually made that. Um, but 
That is uh, just a little video to encourage you to come to the relationship seminar that Biblical Concepts and Counseling is going to be hosting here uh, on Friday and Saturday, April 19th and 20th. So if you're interested in that, there's more info out in the lobby. And with that, we're going to go ahead and pray. Uh, so today we are praying for Lily, uh, who is one of the missionaries that we get to support here at Meadowbrook. And we're going to be praying for Living Water Community Church. So would you just join me as we pray this morning? Heavenly Father, we just come before you and we thank you so much just for everything that you do, God. Um, we thank you that we get to support missionaries that are going out and um, and, and doing your work to, to further your kingdom. And so, God, we lift up Lily to you and just we ask that you would continue to provide for her and open doors for her in ways that only you can. It says she's on mission for you, God, and just what an amazing thing that is. And, God, we also lift up... Uh, Living Water Community Church to you, God. We ask that for everyone that steps in their doors today that you would open hearts and minds to you, God. Uh, soften them to to your word, that they would not leave the same, but that they would leave closer to you and knowing you better. For any that don't know you, we pray that today might be the day that their hearts are softened to you and that they would come to a, a saving faith and relationship with you, God. And God, I pray the same thing for us here at Meadowbrook, for everyone here. Would you just soften our hearts and minds to you, God? Uh, and for those that don't know you, to soften their hearts as well, that we would be um, ready to hear what you have given Keith to preach on this morning. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. With that, would you please stand and read with us our call to worship this morning. Our call to worship this morning comes from Romans chapter 5, verses 8 through 11. It says, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also celebrate in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have, uh, we have now received the reconciliation.
time, the usher's going to distribute the cups. You can be seated. We're going to celebrate communion together. If you're visiting with the uh, Meadowbrook, uh, welcome. We're so glad you're here. Uh, communion is for everybody uh, that has placed their faith and trust in Jesus. And so if you're a Christian in this room, by all means, uh, please take the cup and the bread. If you're not, uh, we just ask you to abstain. It's, it's, it's kind of a serious, uh, it is a serious thing. We're told to, to check our hearts and to, like, if there's anything in our, in our lives, any sin or anything that's going on, to just confess it beforehand, not to, not to in a lighthearted way, celebrate and uh, remember uh, the death of Christ and his sacrifice for our sins through the, the bread and the cup. There's a passage in Isaiah chapter 53 I want to share with you just to kind of to prepare our hearts for this, for this moment. He was pierced for our, our offenses. He was crushed for our wrongdoing. The punishment for our well-being was laid upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the wrongdoing of us all to fall on him. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent before its shears, so he did not open his mouth. It continues in verse 10, but the Lord desired to crush him, causing him grief. If he renders himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. All of that, speaking of Jesus, uh, the Christ. And so, before we even uh, take the bread, let's just, just take a moment now, just before you and the Lord, in the quietness of your own heart, just go before him and just, whatever it is that you need to, to, to confess, or whatever it is that you need to to, to bring before him. Do that now before we celebrate uh, this bread and this cup. our sin that he bore, our pains that he carried. We ourselves assume that he had been afflicted, struck down by God and humiliated, but he was pierced. He was pierced for our offenses, and he was crushed for our wrongdoing. that Jesus was betrayed as his, he and his disciples celebrated the Passover meal together. He held up the bread. It was unleavened bread like this. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. And every time you gather together, I want you to remember that I went to the cross on your account to, to bear the sins that, you, that you're that you responsible for. Like I, I, I'm bearing those sins. I'm, I'm going to the cross for, penal, for a penalty that you deserve. I'm about to go to the cross and experience the wrath of my Father on your account. That's what he was going to do. And he said, every time you gather together, I want you to remember that. So let's take the bread and let's eat together. Testament in Leviticus it says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission, there is no forgiveness of sins. Every lamb 
leading up to the Passover, every lamb that was sacrificed, every year there was 200 plus thousand lambs that were sacrificed and slaughtered on behalf of the sins of the people during Passover on the Day of Atonement. Every single one pointed to the perfect lamb. Every single one pointed to the lamb of God who would be slain for our sins. The lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The lamb of God that God in his love sent to live the life that we can never live and die a death that we deserve. Jesus held up one of the cups in that Passover meal and he said, my blood's going to be shed for you. And every time you gather together, I want you to drink this in remembrance of me. So let's drink together. Let's stand and let's sing this song together.
have a scripture reading. I just had a few announcements that I wanted to uh, share with you. Uh, don't forget to sign up for the parenting class if that's something that's of interest to you. And then Christianity Explored, which is, I'm offering that class. It's beginning next week. I've had people from all over the spectrum in terms of their faith journey uh, come to that class. People who have been Christians for all their lives, and then uh, people who have um, come to just faith in Christ recently, and, and even I've had skeptics, and so uh, I've never had, I've taught this, I don't know, since 2012, I think, uh, but it's, it's been a while. I've never had anybody who've gone through, who has gone through it regretted going through it. Seven weeks long, we work our way through the gospel of Mark. You'll get uh, a workbook uh, for free, that, that, that's for free, and um, yeah, I would love for you to do that. You can get one of these cards out in the foyer and use the QR code to scan to sign up that way, or you can uh, you could do it with by just tearing off one of these, you know, the bulletin thing, and then putting it in the box on your way out. Or there's a sign-up sheet that you can sign up for as well. Would love for you to be a part of that. So, uh, with that being said, Prentice, could you come up and do uh, read the scriptures for us? And please rise <laughs> to honor God's word. Um, I am Prentice. I'm one of the young adults here at Meadowbrook. Um, therefore, remember that previously you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by the so circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands, Remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the people of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who previously were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the hostility, which is the law composed of commandments expressed in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two one new person, in this way establishing peace, and that he might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, by it having put to death the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him... We both have our access in one spirit to the Father. You may be seated. Well, how's everybody? I'm well. I, I thought I was like Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz when I went to bed last night listening to the vortex that is the wind around us. Our bedroom is like on the side where all the wind, you know, hits, and so uh, it was, I kind of did a fun thing, it was, I think it was last year for friends of ours who live in Alabama, did our wind gauge, is our toilet bowl, our toilet bowl, because the water swishes back and forth when it's really windy, and so you know it's windy when the water's going, I mean, you could surf in that thing last night, like it was that windy, and, uh, and so I don't know about you, but yeah, that, that, we've only experienced that in Wyoming, in Cheyenne. So yeah, I'm good. Uh, yeah, um, I did think it would be fun to try. And not, I'm not going to do it today, but wouldn't it be neat to see what would happen if you tried to fly a kite in this wind? Like, no, no, probably a bad idea. Okay, we should pray. All right, let's pray. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Let's ask Him to do the thing that only He can do in our lives. Pray uh, that He'll give you eyes to see, that He'll give you ears to hear, and. Soften your heart. Let's just take time right now to pray uh, for those things that God will do in our lives. Let's pray.
pray for the same thing for the person sitting either either to your left or your right or in front of you. Pray, pray that God would do the same thing in that person's life that you prayed for your own life. God, you are awesome. You are awesome. You are able to, t- to, to do things that, we're, that we can't do. You, you do the impossible. You speak galaxies into existence. You, 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 you made man from the dust of the earth. And God, you raised the dead. You, you can do the impossible. And now we ask that you will do the thing in our lives that we are powerless to do in our own life. God, speak into our lives. Give us ears to hear. Give us eyes to see. Give us a heart that would receive your word and change us, Lord. We ask that you would change us. God, we ask that that in these moments to come, as we sit under uh, the preaching of your word, that that you would give us the ability to, to do what Paul prayed for, and that is to see with the eyes of our heart the reality of uh, of, of, of the gospel and what it means for us, the, the truths of your word and what it means for us, God. Have your way with us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you have a Bible, I, I hope that you can just turn open to it, to uh, Ephesians chapter 2. I, there are things here that I want you to see. I want you to see things in, in God's word that I believe will bless you. Uh, and so, Turn open there, use your digital device, use something. Uh, use one of the, the Bibles that's under the chair in front of you. How many of you remember the Berlin Wall? Or the, the, the wall that's over, okay, cool. Uh, I remember, I remember, I remember it coming down. How many of you were, were alive then? <laughs> uh, some of you weren't alive yet, but uh, I remember, I was, in, I was watching TV and, and watched the, the wall like bit by bit taken down. I remember thinking this is a significant day. I remember uh, just, I remember the emotions that I felt, that this was an important, that that day was an important day. Uh, how, how it came to be, this, this wall, at the end of World War II, at the Potsdam Conference in Ju- on July 17, 1945, just after World War II, it was decided how Germany would be divided by the American, British, French, and Soviet allied leaders. Soviet meaning the Russian, you know, R- R- Russian um, allied leaders. Germany was divided into four zones of occupation to be controlled by the United States, Britain, France, and uh, communist Russia. Uh, the city of Berlin, even though it was in the sector that was controlled by communist Russia, was also split into, uh, into four, uh, four parts or managed by four powers. And uh, you had, they essentially had West Berlin and you had East Berlin. East Berlin was ruled by communists, Russia. Uh, The West was to demonstrate democracy and and just the fruits of of democracy. In 1949, Germany split into two independent nations. Uh, The West was known for its democracy. The East was known for its communism. demonstrated a a stark ideological difference between the two. And it existed that way up until the late 80s. In 1952, the East German government closed its borders with West Germany. In 1961, on August 12th and the end of August 13th, uh, the the East surrounded their border with with barbed wire. Later on, uh, they would erect a wall known as, um, well, for Berlin, it it was known as the Berlin Wall, but it separated those who were free from those who were under communist oppression. Now, the Soviet Union at the time would not call it that, but that's what it was. And and you know, it was was visible, the difference between, you know, the free uh, people and those who lived under this oppressive government. In, this, in this, some of the same ways that you can see that same thing demonstrated in North Korea versus South Korea. And so that was that, was that day. And, and there, the, so this wall was built, 
and it separated families, it separated communities, it separated friends. The wall measured about 96 miles long, it was 13 feet tall, and anyone who were attempting to leave e the eastern side of the country to flee to, what, to the f more free western side of the country risked being shot and killed. By 1989, there were 302 towers along, along the 96-mile-long wall that separated the free from the burdened, from the, you know, those who were under the oppressive heel of the, of the Soviet Union. On June 12, 1987, I remember the president at the time, President Ronald Reagan, delivering a speech just outside of the Berlin Wall on the west side. How many of you remember that? Okay, so some of us are dating ourselves now. But uh, I remember that. I remember what I felt when it, as the president gave his speech. I won't read the whole speech, but there's just a small section of it I want to read for you against the backdrop of Ephesians chapter 2 because I think it just, it's a really great illustration of the kind of wall that Paul's talking about here that was brought down versus the wall like the Berlin Wall. So this is what our president said. Behind me stands a wall that encircles the free sectors of the city, part of a vast system of barriers that divides the entire continent of Europe. From the Baltic South, those barriers cut across Germany in a gash of barbed wire, concrete, dog runs, and guard towers. Further south, there may be no visible or no obvious wall, but there remain armed guards and checkpoints all the same. Still a restriction on the right to travel, still an instrument to impose upon ordinary men and women the will of a totalitarian state. Yet it is here in Berlin where the wall emerges most clearly, here cutting across your city, where the news, uh, where the news photo and television screen have imprinted this brutal division of a continent upon the mind of the world. Standing before the Brandenburg Gate, every man is a German, separated from his fellow men. Every man is a Berliner, forced to look upon a scar. As long as this gate is closed, as long as this scar of a wall is permitted to stand, it is not the German question alone that remains open, but the question of freedom for all mankind. General Secretary Gorbachev, if you seek peace, if you seek prosperity for the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, if you seek liberalization, come here to this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, open this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. And the speech was nicknamed Tear Down This Wall. You can find it on YouTube. You can listen to the, the, to the speech in its entirety. On March, or no, on November 9th, 1989, I remember when the wall began to be picked apart by those within Germany. On October 3rd, 1990, East Germany and West Germany were no more. Germany was reunited as one free nation. I remember that day. Some of you remember that day. There's a wall that Paul mentions here in Ephesians chapter 2 that's significant. and My hope is that... Uh, that you'll be able to see the gospel against the backdrop of the wall that Paul's talking about here, the wall that, that was uh, torn down. Now, uh, I'm assuming most of you, if not all of you, have placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ in this room. I'm going to talk to you as though you're a Christian, uh, in the same way that Paul uh, addresses these Ephesians as if the, uh, the only ones reading this letter were Christians. But if you're not a Christian... The things that Paul says that was once true of the Christian is still true of you. You still need to be reconciled to God, the God of all creation, through his son, Jesus Christ. But remember like what I said in this, in this whole sermon series, and that Ephesians answers two questions for us. It answers the question of what does it mean to be a Christian, and you can't understand what it means to be a Christian unless you understand what it means to be the church, capital C. And you cannot understand what it means to be the church unless you understand what it means to be a Christian. And, and all of the epistle in its six chapters answers those two questions for us, but here is where we, we understand what is it that, that, that has really changed if you're a Christian. 
Right? Besides the fact that you're, that you're alive in Jesus, what has really changed? And so there are two, two points. The first is this, is that the Christian has been brought near to God. We, were, we who were far from God have been brought near to God. And there are four, four statements that Paul is going to make, or four points that he's going to make in, in verses 11 through 13. And the first is this, is that you, if you are a Christian, you were at one time Christless. You were without Christ. Uh, that's in verse 11 and the very first part of verse 12. It says, therefore, remember that previously you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands. There are two groups of people since, since Abraham was told that as a, as a recipient of the covenant of God, that he, were, he was to circum, be circumcised and every, every male child and male within the covenant community were to be circumcised. There are two groups of people. There are the circumcised, and then there are the uncircumcised. The circumcised were the Hebrew people. The uncircumcised were Gentiles. How many of you in this room uh, are not Jewish? Raise your hand. How many of you are Jewish? Just curious. We didn't have anybody in the first service. Um, right. So according to Ephesians chapter 2, every single one of you was far from the promises of God at one point in your life. And we were Christless. We were Christless. Now, there, there are two truths that were true of both the circumcised and the uncircumcised, that the, the, they both, sh both groups shared this in common. The Ephesian church were made up of mostly Gentiles. And there were probably some Jews in there who had placed their faith and trust in Christ that were a part of that city. But there are two things that are true of the circumcised and the uncircumcised. Uh, both groups believed that, so, that, that because they had religion, they were, they were taken care of if, if anything should happen to them. Because they had religion, they, knew, they, they believed that, that the afterlife was taken care of. That was the one thing that they had in common. The, the Ephesians, the Ephesian Gentiles, they had Artemis uh, before they met Christ. That's who they thought that they had. And, and the Jews, they thought just because their, their lineage is tied to Abraham, that, that they were in, that they were in, and that they were the people of God. The reality is, is that both were dead in their sins and their trespasses, and both groups were Christless at one point in their life. We, we, we share that in common with, with everybody. The only thing that separates you and me from uh, those who, who are outside of the church, who are not Christians, is, uh, is, is Christ. Is Christ. So you, at one time, were Christless. The second thing is that you were homeless. Now, what do I mean by that? I was trying to find something with L... <laughs> with L-E-S-S -S at the end, and I, I really struggled, so I came up with homeless, so there you go. That's the Baptist in me. Um, we were Christless, we were homeless. Well, what do I mean by homeless? Well, if you look at this, uh, at the scripture here, remember that you, at the, in verse 12, you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the people of Israel, meaning you, 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 didn't, you weren't a direct recipient of the promises that Israel were recipients of, like the promise that was made to Abraham. Well, what promise was that? Well, it was the promise that through Abraham's seed or through his gene pool, all the nations would be blessed. Uh, Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Like, go from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house and the, the, to the land that I'm going to show you. And I will make you into a great nation, Abraham, and I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. And the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you all the what? What, the families of Israel? No, the families of the earth will be blessed. The, 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 in, the intention of God was always to bless the nations, and, and the medium that he would use would be, would be the Hebrew people, that through them the nations would be blessed. But if you're a Gentile and, and, you, and you, were not, you didn't hear of the promises of, of God, you, you were homeless in the sense of, you had, you, you had no hope of being reconciled to God. And so that, that's the second thing. The promise was for the nations, not just Abraham, not just the Jews. It was for the nations, which leads me to the third point, is that you were hopeless. So you were Christless, you were homeless, and you were hopeless. You were hopeless. Verse, uh, it goes on to say in verse, verse 12 that 
you were strangers to the covenant of the promises, or to the promise. You were strangers to the covenant of promise. Well, what's the covenant of the promise? That God would take your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh and a new spirit he would put in you. That God would circumcise your heart and, and give you a heart of flesh so that you would love him and obey him. Those are the covenants of, of, of promise. It's Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. It's also, the promise includes Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 through 7. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of armies will accomplish this. How long will his kingdom last? Forever. Good answer. Forever. It will last forever. Now, for, for the Ephesian Christians who were Gentiles, the, the best thing that they had going for them before Jesus was, was Rome, was the emperor, who was most likely Nero at, this, at the time that Ephesians was written. And, and so that was it. In, in the same way, in the same way that when the Berlin Wall was taken down, there were people there who believe that this is as good as it gets. Like, they, this, this, is the, this is the hope of the nations. Tear down communism. Get rid of communism. If we could all just be free, then, then all, the, all, all the stuff in this world, all the bad things will go away. And what has happened? We've just become more violent. We're, we're closer to standing on the knife edge of destroying ourselves than ever before as, as a species. And, uh, and so Paul's saying here, yet you were one time, at one time, you were hopeless. But you're not hopeless anymore, Christian, because you have Christ. And because you have Christ, you have the promises uh, of the scriptures. We're recipients of those promises. We get to experience the blessing that God had promised Abraham. And the city that he was looking for, that whose builder was, was not man but God, like, we're looking and longing for a different city. This is not as good as it gets uh, on this side of eternity. I, I, I used this illustration in the past. It's one of my favorite illustrations. It's my favorite illustration to share with somebody who doesn't, uh, who's not yet a Christian. And that is, like, for the Christian, uh, uh, this life, this life that you experience, all the good things and the bad things, you pick the worst that you could possibly experience in this life, on this side of eternity, and you will have experienced the closest thing that you will ever come to experiencing hell if you're a Christian. If you're not a Christian, the closest that you will ever come to experiencing heaven, the best that you can find on, uh, in, in your experience on this earth is the closest, if you're not a Christian, is the closest that you will ever come to experiencing heaven. That puts things in perspective, doesn't it? Like if, you're a, if you're a Christian, you're not hopeless you, you, you have the promises of God. You have, you, you have this, this promise that he will wipe away the tears that stain our eyes, that he's going to make all things new. This, this is why we don't need to get bent out of shape as to what's going to happen you know, in this next, next election. Now, like, go vote. I think you should vote. I'm going to vote. But, but if, if the candidate that you vote for isn't the one that gets elected, that's not the end of the world. Because there's a king, and his name is Jesus, and he's going to reign forever and ever. And every kingdom leading, uh, you know, leading up to his kingdom has a shelf life. There's an expiration date on America, on China, on Mexico, on Canada, uh, North Korea, South Korea, Russia. There's an expiration date on there that, that only God knows. And uh, there's an expiration date on China. Uh, the king is going to come. We are not hopeless. But there was a time in, in, in our existence when we were because we were separate from Christ. And it's fourth, that we were godless. Now what I mean by godless is that we were without God. <laughs> uh, not just being like immoral, like we were without God. And by definition of being without God, we were godless. I said last week, like, all roads lead to God. Every single road except for one leads to him as judge. 
Only one leads to him as Father, and that is through Jesus Christ. So you were at one point godless, separate from God. You stood opposed to him. You stood under a looming wrath and judgment that, we, that every single one of us deserved. But because we're not Christless, Jesus bore that wrath in our place, and so now we have God. We've been reconciled to him. This is like verse 13. It says, uh, now, but now in Christ Jesus, you who previously were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Listen, each and every one of us at some point in our life was far from God, and we were brought near. And what it means to be brought near is that we have a relationship with him. We are known by the God of all creation, and if you're a Christian, you can cry out to him as father. You are now his son. You are now his daughter. You who are previously far away have been brought near, which leads me to the second point, and that is Christ, the Christian has the peace of God. Now, this is where I was geeking out a little bit. Like, I didn't have time to go into last week to go into like the details of verses 11 through 13. We just did that, so I feel, I feel good about that now. I feel good about verses 11 through 13, but verses 14 through 18, Verses 14 through 18. What is this wall that Paul's talking about here? Hey, verse 14. For he himself is our peace, that is, Jesus is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. Like, what is he talking about? What is he talking about? Uh, now, before I tell you what, it, what I believe he's talking about, let me say this. It was always God's intention to use his people, Israel, to be his, 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 the medium, the, the, the catalyst, the instrument by which he uh, brings good news to the nations. It was always the plan. In Exodus chapter 9, verses 5 through 6, we see it here. So it says, Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant. So he's speaking to Israel. They had just been freed from the bondage of, of slavery in Egypt. Then you shall be my own possession among the peoples, for, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. So what are they going to be? A kingdom of what? Of priests. What does a priest do? Don't think Catholic. Like, it wasn't like Israel's like, okay, you must say five our fathers and three Hail Marys and you're good. I could say that. I grew up Catholic. Some of you are like really quiet. All right. So, so, so you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Like a kingdom of priests, is, a priest is somebody who mediates between people and God. So are they to be a kingdom of priests all unto themselves? No. They as a people were to be a kingdom of priests as representatives before the nations. They were to mediate God between themselves and the nations. That was always the plan. Malachi chapter 1, verse 11, uh, he said something similar. Like, this is the goal. This is the end goal. Ready? Let's read this together. For from the rising of the sun, even to its setting, my name shall be great among the nations. And in every place, frankincense is going to be offered to my name, and a grain offering that is, a, that is pure. For my name shall be great among the nations, says the Lord of armies. Like, is his name just going to be great in Israel? No. Where is his name going to be great? Throughout the nations. Throughout the nations. And this is why, again, Jesus said to his disciples after he, he, he died on the cross for sins that we're guilty of, and on the third day rose from the grave, that's last week, that's what we celebrated last week, uh, he said to his disciples, go therefore and make disciples of what? All nations, all ethnos, all people groups. And baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them all that I have commanded you, and I am with you to when? The end of the age. I'm, go I'm going with you. Like, that was always the plan. So, backing up a little bit. So, when w the temple that was the center of worship in Jesus' day was the temple that Herod built. Solomon's temple was torn down. Uh, and then there was another temple in its place for a little bit. And then Herod built this, like, beautiful temple. And, um, and, and this was the center of worship. There was, you know, you had the Holy of Holies. And there was a sacrificial system, like, as I mentioned. Uh, like, over 200,000 lambs would be slaughtered uh, during Passover. 
uh, for the atonement and the sins of the people. It was used like throughout the week and throughout the days. Uh, but there's, in Herod's temple, there was something that existed that was not in God's plan for the temple or for the tabernacle. And the, and the thing that was not in God, written in God's plan was uh, the, the court of the Gentiles. So the, the court of the Gentiles is something that Herod uh, set up, and I believe, you know, because there was this, there was this culture, or, <coughs> excuse me, this mindset that was set up that the Gentiles were too far from God, so far from God. And they could come and they can do some kind of worship, but they couldn't go to the place that was holy because they were just too far from God. But the Jews, the recipients of Abraham, of the promise of Abraham, and because their lineage could be t- tied back to Abraham, they could have access to the holier areas of the temple. But the Gentiles, they're out in the courts. That's where they lived. Or, I mean, that's where they dwelt. Uh, I mean, that's where they hung out. Uh, there was a wall. There was a wall that was erected. It was about four and a half feet tall. And I don't know in this diagram if this is the wall or if it's another wall, but on the, on the outside of the wall is the, is the, the uh, court of the Gentiles. Beyond that wall, they were not permitted to go, they were not permitted to go beyond the wall. Why is this significant? Because I believe this is what Paul's talking about. There is a sign. Actually, there is signage that, and they got two example, or two samples of this in two different museums. There's a museum in, in Israel that has this, and there's another museum, I think, in, 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 in Istanbul. Well, I can't even say it. You know where I'm coming from. Yeah, there, in that museum. So, um, and this is what it said on there. No foreigner may enter within the balustrade around the sanctuary and the enclosure. Whoever is caught on himself shall be put blamed for the death of which will ensue, meaning if you cross this line, you're a dead person. So Paul, now, now you kind of have that in your mind, right? And so against the backdrop, that backdrop, Paul writes in verse 14, for he himself is our peace who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier for the, uh, uh, of the dividing wall. That's what I believe Paul is talking about in these verses. Uh, God never written into, had written into the plan, a, a, as far as I see in all the Bible, a temple or a court of the Gentiles. It, it, just in case you're not aware, this is what the, the tabernacle looked like. This is, the, this is the place that God said, okay, this is what you're to build, and every time you set camp, you set this up, and every time you move, you tear it down. So it was meant to be portable. But there was no court of the Gentiles here. There's a passage in Isaiah basically said this of the Gentiles, and, and and just listen to this, because you'll, you'll, you'll hear something familiar regarding something Jesus said. Uh, also the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord. So the Gentiles who say, you know what? This God is legit. I want to worship him. So uh, the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to attend to his services and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, everyone who keeps the Sabbath so, so as not to profane it, and holds firmly to my covenant, even those I will bring to my holy mountain and, I, and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Now, some of you are starting to connect the dots here. Their, their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be acceptable on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all the peoples. You hear it? So, go back, so let's go to the next slide. So Jesus comes into, into Jerusalem, right? This is Palm, Palm Sunday, two weeks ago. He comes into Jerusalem, and he enters into Jerusalem, and, and we're, we're told he enters into the, temple, into the temple as he's making his way in, and he gets super, he gets agitated. He, gets, he like gets angry because as he enters in, he sees these money changers. So, so this was not uncommon in temples, not just with Israel, but temples for other people groups that worship Stuff, it would become kind of like the banking center. And so, it, and it wasn't all that different with, with this temple. There was a place where people would exchange money because you couldn't use like pagan coinage because it had idols on it. So you had to change the money for acceptable money, like a type of shekel that didn't have a idol or some graven image on it. And so they would do that. 
And, uh, and I mean, if you're purchasing, if you've got people purchasing lambs to the equivalent of 200,000 lambs to be sacrificed, you need somebody who's, who's um, able to change your money. And also you have people who, uh, in this one area that would sell stuff and, you know, sell sacrifices. You want to know where that was? It, was? it was the court of the Gentiles. It was the court of the Gentiles that Jesus would hang out and teach, which is really interesting. So he comes into the court of the Gentiles, whether, I don't know if it's here or if it's, you know, in here, but who knows. But, it, but he comes in, he sees the money changers, and he starts throwing tables, right? Remember that? Starts throwing tables. And, and this is what we read. We re read this account in Mark chapter 11. He entered the temple area and began to drive out those who were selling and buying on the temple grounds. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple grounds. And he began to teach and say to them, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all the nations? For all the nations. But you have made it a den of robbers. And so what did they do? One week later, they crucified him. Jesus was the representation of perfect Israel. He was the one who, 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 who kept the law perfectly. And, and they crucified him. They crucified him. And we talked about that last week. They crucified him. Because Israel thought that because they had Abraham, that was enough. And they crucified the God-man who came to live the life that they could never live, and he died a death that they all deserved. It, was, it is a wall... <laughs> There's a wall that Israel, that the Jews, and the Gentiles, for that matter, did not see that existed, that was greater than a four-and-a-half-foot wall. It was greater than the Berlin Wall. It's greater than any wall you can ever imagine. It's the wall of our own sin. And Paul says, that wall, that wall has been torn down. You guys think a four-and-a-half-foot wall in Herod's temple, temple was an issue. Well, it, well it's not. The, the, the wall that you really need to be consider, concerned about is the wall of your own sin that separates you from God. Like that wall, that wall you can't do anything about. That wall you have no power to remove. That wall, uh, the, the, that if it continues to exist, you're, you're doomed, like you're, you're damned. And Paul says, if, if you're a Christian, you who were once Christless now have Christ. You who were once homeless now are a recipient of the promises of God. You who once had no hope now have hope. And you who were once godless now have God. You have a relationship with him. And, and that wall has been not only torn down, that wall has been blown to ashes through the cross of Jesus Christ. And we've been redeemed. Like Galatians chapter 3 says this, that he, that is Christ, redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. That's how the wall was torn down. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, which you should be familiar with by now, like he, uh, through Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our wrongdoings. What wrongdoings? All of our wrongdoings. All of our sin. That wall has been, the, the wall of our sin, the, the wall that, that, that alienated us, us from God, uh, that has been torn down. That's your identity, brothers and sisters. That's your identity. Now, here's where it gets really, like, even more real, right? Verses, ver verse 15, by abolishing in his flesh the hostility, which is the law composed of commandments expressed in ordinances, so that in himself we might, ha we might make the two, or that in himself he might make the two one new person in this way establishing peace, and that he might reconcile them both in one body to God, through the cross, by it having put to death the hostility. Well, what two groups are you talking about, Paul? He's talking about the circumcision and the uncircumcision. The uncircumcision are the what? The Gentiles. The circumcision are the Hebrew people. And, and it's Jesus Christ that makes the two groups one. Here's, here's where, where it gets real for us. Because he has done that, there, there is something that binds you with every other Christian in the world. It's something as a person. It's Jesus, right? 
So the, so the Chinese Christian, the Iranian Christian, the Korean Christian, the Burmese Christian, the Indian Christian, the South American Christian, the Canadian Christian, and the Mexican Christian all wear the same colors. We all belong to the, the Lamb. No longer does our skin color or our culture or our language divide us. We've been brought into one group of people. Yeah, does, that, like, does that jive with you? Like, think about that. Like, you are covered under the blood of the Lamb. This is why racism and, and coarse talking about other ethnicities is evil. It's evil. Like Jesus came to redeem the nations. The ethnos, literally that's what the word is, is ethnos, ethnicities, people groups. And now do the math a little bit here. So let's just, let's just picture this. Like how, how many people live on planet Earth? It's like eight something billion, right? How, what is the majority of the population of, the, the, of people, of humans that live on the Earth? Who, who makes up that majority? Just so you can say it's fine. You're not gonna you're not gonna flunk class today. <laughs> Probably China, right? When you agree, like it's pretty a bit. It's a big place. Um, how many like, how many Asians compared to uh, uh, Caucasians are gonna be in heaven? Here's the point. Like it doesn't really matter. <laughs> like, we've been brought into one new people. That's what it means to be the church. That's what it means to be the church. We wear the same tribal colors, first and foremost. Red, the blood of Jesus Christ. We belong to him. Christian, that is your identity, first and foremost. You're not an American first. You're a Christian first and an American second. And I love my country. I have nieces and nephews who serve this country. I've considered seriously uh, going, going into, the, uh, you know, into chaplaincy, part uh, in the reserves. I, I've thought about that long and hard, recently actually. Like, I love my country, but I am a citizen of the kingdom of God first and foremost, and so are you. Here's the other thing. The, the thing that binds you, to, binds you together with the Chinese Christian, and the Iranian Christian, and the Mexican Christian, and the South American Christian, and the Canadian Christian, and, and every other Christian is, is, a bind, is a binding that's stronger than the binding that you experience with your own family who do not know Jesus. It's here, and Paul's saying, like, who, who's responsible for making that happen? Jesus. Jesus is. He accomplished it. He blew to ashes the, the dividing wall. And, uh, and, and he's making one people group under the blood of the Lamb. And that's you and that's me. And so he, he says, for he himself is our peace. He made both groups into one. And then he goes into verse 17. And he came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. That's what binds us together. That's what brings us together. This is the thing that you share with, with Christians, even if you don't share the same language or the same culture. And believe me, like, I believe, I'm, I'm convinced, I think I can argue it from the Bible, that God will not do away with language and culture on the new earth and in heaven. That's not, that, those things aren't the result of the curse. The curse is how we treat one another. That's the, re, that's the evidence of the curse. Culture is celebrated. Culture is celebrated uh, by God. That's a, that's, a, that's a gift from God. Language and, 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 and the way people dance and the way they celebrate based on their culture, um, like that's not inherently evil. Uh, and so that I don't think is done away with. I think we'll have all eternity to learn different languages and, um, and learn different cultures. Uh, but at the end of the day, we are covered under the blood of the Lamb. We wear his colors. We're his people. Amen? Like that, and Jesus did it all. He did it all. If you're not a Christian in this room, my question to you, and the worship team can come up, by the way. My question to you is, well, why wait? Why would you wait? Why would you wait? Like you stand, if you're not a Christian, you stand separate from, from God. You, you, there is a dividing wall. That dividing wall is your sin. And, and the cross of Christ 
is what remedies that sin, what can take down that wall. Um, and until you place your faith and trust in Jesus, until you find your righteousness in him alone, that wall exists. That wall exists. But he came to take it down. He came to take it down. Um, we wear his colors. We wear his colors. Let's stand and let's sing this song together and then I'll come, I'll come back up and, and close out our time. A gift of grace is Jesus my redeemer there is no
taken the scroll, when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to break its seals, for you were slaughtered and you purchased people for God with your blood from every tribe, language, people, and nation, and you have made them into a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Then I looked and I heard the voices of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders and the numbers of them were myriads and myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slaughtered to receive power, wealth, and wisdom, and might, honor, glory, and blessing. And I heard every creature Every created thing which is in heaven, or on the earth, or under the earth, or on the sea, and all things in them, saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And all God's people said, Amen. Hey, if you're not a Christian, the Bible says if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the grave, you will be saved. There is salvation found in no one else but the name of Jesus the Christ, period. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except by me. Why wait? Don't leave here without placing your faith and trust in Christ or talk to somebody about it. For the rest of us, man, it is so good. It is so good to be covered under the blood of the Lamb, is it not? To be His, to be His. There's condemnation. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen? All right, you're dismissed. Have a great rest of your day. We'll see you next week.